Good morning and welcome to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. Today is Wednesday, um, November, well, March, <laughs> March, March 16, <laughs> um, and the first part of our morning we're going to be um, having a discussion around the impact of uh, H 728 and act relating to opioid overdose response services, um, the impact on on our Medicaid program, um, one of the pieces in the bill that we passed that's sitting in appropriations relates to prior authorization as it relates to Medicaid. And um, so that is our just that is our focus today. And we have with us to um, help educate us <coughs> is um, Ms. James, who is the um, oh actually Dr. James, sorry, your PhD. Um, who's the healthcare director from the Department of Vermont Health Access and the uh, commissioner of DIVA, um, uh, Andrea um, de la Bre <laughs> Very, uh, very excellent, excellent try, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how do you, I apologize, how do you pronounce your name? It's de la Briere, but no worries. Uh, very few people. It's Lubriere. the lovely Lubriere. three name. Uh, it's actually three words. Yeah. All of the almost all the letters of the alphabet, practically. But it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, for the record, Andrea de la Briere, Commissioner for the Department of Vermont Health Access, and we were anticipating. Uh, Nancy Hogue, our director of pharmacy, joining us as well. I want to make sure she's on here. She, she has not. She may be having trouble connecting. She is also one of our subject matter experts that um, we're anticipating having joined today. So we're here today to talk about the fiscal implications. Um, but first, I, I really want to take a moment and appreciate the work that you're doing with this particular bill. This. These topics are near and dear to my heart, um, as I have not personal experience with the issues, but certainly someone I was very close to um, has been impacted by these issues. So definitely appreciate the work you're doing and it's very thoughtful, insightful work that has happened over this the course of, I can see the many drafts here um, that, that you're really taking the time to try to address the crisis that we're in. So thank you. I wanted to start there. Um, but as we dive into the fiscal implications specifically for Vermont Medicaid, you'll see there would be a significant impact with the ch proposed changes. And um, if we don't have Nancy yet, I'm wondering if Nissa, we, you and I may want to walk through this together. Um, I, I think that probably makes sense. Um, I, I want to ask a naive question and perhaps um, Um, whether the words said it, what we were going for was not to totally remove prior authorization. And um, our, our very clear reading of your memo, um, we wondered if, if those words weren't clear and if in fact what you were responding to was a remo total removal of prior authorization. It's a great question, and I really, I really do appreciate that. I think for us, um, the the change to include Medicaid in the bill, I think, was probably our biggest challenge, um, simply because the our responsibilities to manage the whole class of drugs is the fiscal responsibilities to, man, to manage the class of drugs would be impacted by the change by by us being added to the bill. Um, that said, there, the legislative report that we have provided in the past has been a solution to this. And I know I've been doing some research on the history here, and I know that this very similar conversation happened, I believe, in 2019, if I have that right. 2019, it, 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 yeah. it happened. It was a bill started in the Senate. Yeah. And I think it was because of what was perceived um, as the fiscal implications that the compromise was to um, not include um, Medicaid, but have a report. Right. And when right. we look at the report and the numbers, 
what we see in the report, and this is, we may not understand all of the, how things work, but when we see the numbers in the report and we do analysis based on that, we don't quite come to the same um, huge impact that uh, you presented us with. Understood. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you for the background on that. And this will be today's presentation will be a, a, a comprehensive and more holistic look as to what you see in the report uh, versus to what you see in that report. So I hope that this provides some clarity. Um, but just to circle back just a moment, we are more than happy to continue providing a report to you if that is acceptable versus um, having Medicaid named in the bill, if that's the direction you determine to, to go in. What we'd like to do today, what I'd like to do is now that Nancy has joined us, um, I'd like to hand off to Nancy to walk through the fiscal impacts here to um, further explain how we arrived at the numbers that we have. And um, as you know, this is managing access we want people to have access to the medications they need um, while also being fiscally responsible. So with that, I'll hand off to Nancy, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Nancy, she has the information and she'll walk you through. Good morning. Good um, morning, Nancy. Good morning. I'm Nancy Hogue and I'm the Director of Pharmacy Services for DIVA. Um, I've been with the state for 12 years um, and I'm, certain I've been in front of this committee before, so it's nice to see everybody. So Thank let me you. just walk through um, how we arrived at that fiscal impact. It really was composed of three separate impacts. Um, one of the um, significant impacts is since we, since the bill prohibits us from really managing the MAT class as we do currently, um, we will, uh, not be able to collect um, the supplemental rebates that we receive on these products today. So we, we um, of course, you, you probably know Medicaid uh, receives a federal rebate on all medications that, uh, that are dispensed for Medicaid members. Um, in addition to the federal rebates, which are statutory and um, are always available to us, uh, we negotiate additional rebates through a consortium, a Sovereign States Drug Consortium. Uh, Vermont was a founding member of that consortium back in 2003. And through that consortium, we're able to ne negotiate additional rebates that we call supplemental rebates. Um, those rebates are uh, negotiated directly with manufacturers. And um, of course, uh, they're willing to give us these ad additional rebates when uh, we can um, help drive utilization to the preferred products. So uh, that $4.2 million is related to the loss of the supplemental rebates, uh, not the federal, on the uh, Suboxone products, on, on, I'm sorry, on the buprenorphine products. Are there any questions about that before I move on? Yes, um, we do have a question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nancy. Question on the supplemental rebates. Are the supplemental rebates dependent on prior authorizations? Um, yes, they are. Um, the uh, manufacturers always require yes. that their product be listed as preferred and that any competitor products be listed as non-preferred. And there are different, um, I guess I would say tiers for those agreements. So it depends on the product and the offer, but sometimes they do not want any other products preferred, only their product. And uh, there's a certain amount of rebate associated with that kind of structure. And then other times we're allowed to have two preferred products um, and then the rest have to be non-preferred. Um, and then, you know, it, it just depends on how the agreement is structured. So, but yes, they always require that non-preferred products require a PA. Did I answer? Yeah. 
I, I, yeah, I was just, I want to follow up on uh, Representative Small's question because um, uh, 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 not quite sure that the answer got at what she was trying to get at. I'm going to try a different way. <laughs> um, so um, with the preferred product um, that you're able to uh, get the rebates on, um, is there another way to communicate that to prescribers um, so that they understand um, that if it's clinically appropriate that they actually prescribe that drug as opposed to a non-preferred drug? So essentially accomplishing the same thing without having to do the current process. Um, it's highly unlikely that manufacturers would accept that structure. Um, you know, prior authorization is very effective at moving utilization. Um, and that's why they typically uh, are looking for that. So I, um, I don't think that would be very effective, one. And number two, I don't think that manufacturers would accept that as a strategy. Follow-up question on that then. Um, so I'm hearing that the agreement that you have with the manufacturers is that there has to be a prior authorization on non-preferred products. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's correct. And so are there prior authorizations for preferred products? No, um, there's no prior authorization on um, uh, two formulations of buprenorphine that are preferred on our preferred drug list. And one of those is Suboxone film. Uh, there is no PA unless the dose exceeds 16 milligrams in um, uh, OBOTS, office-based practices. And um, there is no PA either on buprenorphine naloxone tablets, uh, which uh, again, 60, only if it's over 16 milligrams. Um, if I could follow up, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So the report that we received um, that outlined in 2021, there is some, uh, you know, I think it was over a thousand prior authorizations for Suboxone. Were those all due to quantity being over 16 milligrams? That's correct. Um, I think one of my questions is that they're um, understanding the sort of fiscal impact that you've outlined. Um, we're wondering to what extent, uh, like a sort of scaling back of different components. You know, we outlined maybe four different things in this. One was dosage limits. One was the first 60 days. And the other were designated medications. Um, now, Say if we were to align it with the statute for uh, non-Medicaid insurance and to make it just about no prior authorizations if it's within the dosage limit, would that have a significant change on this fiscal impact? Um, so if, in other words, if we were still able to apply the PA to the non-preferred products, but if we open, if we raised the, if we allowed providers to use up to 24 milligrams in the uh, office-based practices, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that's one configuration of it. Another, um, so I'm, I'm interested in your response on that. Um, that would not have a significant a fiscal impact because then the fiscal impact would be limited to um, the number of PAs that were denied for over 16 milligrams, which, um, you know, uh, we'd have to look at the, I think Lisa, it, it may be testified to that last week, but um, there are a number of those that are denied for over 16, so the fiscal impact would be that um, number of PA denials. And that, that is pretty close um, to what we estimated for 
the second um, uh, fiscal that we estimated it, that was just under $700,000 was prior authorizations that were previously denied um, that would now not be subject to PA. So therefore, all those would be approved essentially. And we estimated $688,000, uh, 0.5 uh, for that. So what, I, what I'm hearing is that the, at least the component about one designated medication not receiving prior authorization, maybe one of the smaller ticket items on this list. But then to be clear about the, um, the mono formula of buprenorphine, uh, what are your thoughts on, on that as far as how it contributes to this amount? Well, that certainly would be part of the contractual negotiation with the manufacturer. And, um, you know, uh, th th uh, there isn't as much of, uh, there isn't really a fiscal impact in that case. The issue there is more clinical, but it, we would have to make sure that that was, you know, not going to affect our contracts. And at this point it is in non-preferred position. So I, um, and but so also just to be clear, um, the kind of first thing on our list of potential uh, exemptions for for um, prior authorization was any medication under within the FDA dosage limit. Is that where you see the majority of this fiscal impact coming from when people can essentially? pick and choose between preferred and non-preferred as long as it's within the dosage limit? The, uh, the fiscal impact is if we change any of the preferred or non-preferred product status. So we currently have two preferred products that's allowed, that, does not, that allows us to collect those supplemental rebates. If, if any of that changes, if we either move a non-preferred to a preferred, or remove a PA on any of the non-preferred, that's what would affect those contracts. Yep, yep. Nancy, right, I, if I could just add a clarification for Rob Whitman. Um, one, of the, one of the questions I think that he's driving at is in H728, under section three, the definition of health insurance plan is changed to include Vermont Medicaid. As a result of that, section four, subsection A, where a health insurance plan shall not require prior authorization for prescription drugs for a patient who is receiving medication-assisted treatment if the dosage is prescribed within the U.S. FDA's dosing recommendations would now apply to Vermont Medicaid. I believe the question he was asking was, would that provision alone result in the fiscal impact that DIVA has provided for the committee's consideration because of the removal of prior authorizations across those therap that therapeutic class in consideration of the language in that section. Yeah, yes, it would affect the supplemental rebates. So I think that, um, thank you. Thank you for that response. But I, I'm also hearing that the concept of having the one designated medication perhaps exempt um, that you could essentially designate as your preferred option. Because again, you have over a thousand prior authorizations for buprenorphine because it's above the quantity limit. Um, you're ultimately approving many of those prior authorizations, right? I mean, there's only so few that you'll ultimately deny. So you're triggering prior authorization for say Suboxone which I'm assuming it's, it, which I believe is your preferred medication. You're going through all of those prior authorizations, you're approving the vast majority of them. Um, and so this, what I'm hearing is that that's a larger fiscal impact and I'll defer to others as far as, um, I'm happy to hear that you're willing to um, 
continue this work. I know that within the house, we are under uh, time constraints as far as how much more tinkering and tweaking we can do uh, with this. I think we'll probably, and, and uh, the amount of sort of uh, time to get back information quickly <laughs> uh, well, may be one of our constraints. I, I would say that um, we can delay action. In other words, if the appropriations is not going to vote out a bill um, with the with with the this section in it um, without given your um, given your fiscal note, but if you all can work with um, Representative Whitman and others, if there is something. Um, we heard testimony that there is, there are some barriers, and so we are. And there there are some barriers for um, folks who whose insurance is paid for through um, Medicaid. And if there is a smaller step or a more um, targeted step that will not have um, such an immense negative impact on um, the rebates and things like that. Um, if you, if, or if I'm fantasizing, but if I'm not fantasizing, if you all would be able to continue the conversation, um, we can always propose an amendment on the, we can delay action on the bill until next Friday. And um, so a week from Friday um, or something like that. Um, I'll just jump um, in. Thank you. Are, you. Yeah. I'm no, sorry. I was say, or if I'm if, if I'm fantasizing, tell me. <laughs> no, I th I think you're. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and these are. I think we're willing to. I think we're willing to definitely collaborate and try to work toward a solution that meets everyone's needs. I I am curious though, who you're hearing from um, regarding barriers because that is. That's a concern. Um, I also have done some research of my own with our hub providers, and they are not experiencing the barriers, or at least that's what they're sharing with me. I would absolutely recommend you speak with some of them. Uh, that's who we go to for expert advice because they see such, you know, hub and spoke providers are, are I think, one of the valuable contributions in, um, you know, in our landscape here in Vermont. Um, and, um, I think my only, I, yes, I think that makes sense. And whether we do it, when I say informally, i.e. a small group, um, absolutely makes those sure. connections. Um, so uh, is there anyone specific the that issues, you can the with, the, with access to the hubs have on some level more to do with where are they and um, the hours they're open, some of those kinds of structural <laughs> issues. Um, some of what, and I'm going to look to Representative Whitman and um, Small, um, some of what we are talking about are the spokes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And um, the spokes that, um, <clears throat> that you know, that, that's all. Um, okay, so you're hearing from the spokes. The, hubs, but the spokes, but I, I hear you and um, we, will, we will do that. And if you could actually provide us with you know either some names of some folks that we could connect with and then we can connect with our own absolutely um, absolutely i i think it benefits all of us um to have more information so i will out follow up with a couple of names for you and um that would be great and in the meantime um is it appropriate for for nancy to review the rest of the the items on the fiscal impact at this point um absolutely. Um, absolutely, you, you you did the work, and that will be educational for us, okay. whose whose focus is policy, and we'll figure out how to pay for it later. <laughs> okay, great. So then I'll hand it back to Nancy, and then um, we'll have some follow up discussions after this. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Um, yep, there was just one other. So we talked about the supplemental rebates, and then we we also talked about the pr previous the PAs that were. Be, that are being denied today, what the fiscal impact of those no longer being denied would be. So it was 4.2 million for the SUPS, 
it was six hundred and eighty eight thousand point five hundred dollars for the uh, previous denied PAs and then the the significant there is a significant impact um, for not being able to prior authorize um, uh, a drug called Sublocade because Sublocade as you probably know is a long-acting buprenorphine depot injection um, it's a new drug and it has no uh, competition in the market at this time um, there is a competitor product um, that has been trying to um, get FDA approval, but they've been um, uh, struggling to get their product on the market. So we don't expect any competition in that class until at least uh, perhaps the end of the year um, or even into 23. So uh, it, as with many new drugs, it's very expensive. And it is anywhere between 10 and 15 times the cost of uh, the oral medications. So we had to estimate an impact of removing a PA um, on that product, even if the utilization of the product is, is minimal. So we estimated um, a sort of bottom uh, impact that of all the buprenorphine that we dispense, if only 10% of that um, was shifted, uh, I'm sorry, if only 8% of that was shifted to the depot injection, um, that that would have an impact um, of $12 million. So it because this product or these collection of buprenorphine products um, just to refresh your memory, this is our number one drug spend. MAT is our number one drug spend. It is also our number one drug by volume. And it's been that way for close to 10 years. So um, that's why the fiscal impact is so big because we use so much MAT in the Medicaid program. And because this particular drug has such a high price point. Um, it's about, uh, you know, it's in excess of 20, let's see, I'm gonna do the math in my head here. It's in excess of $20,000 per patient gross. Um, so it adds up very quickly. So if, 10, if, if we shifted another 8% uh, to that product, that would be 12 million. And then we just set sort of, um, you know, if things really escalated and we saw as much as 25% of the utilization shifting, then that would be um, a $30 million impact. So we tried to give sort of the low and worst case scenario, um, if you will. So that's where those numbers are primarily derived. Representative Small. Thank you. Uh, and so looking at these projection numbers, is, is this increase an anticipated increase, which is why the department's including it in its fiscal impact? Um, or am I understanding that you chose the most expensive product to show fiscal impact? No, this is an anticipated um, impact. Um, we, we took every single drug available in, in the class and uh, determined what the fiscal impact would be. So, um, so that's why, uh, you know, for example, we uh, included the 688,000 because that was an incremental impact to no PA. So we looked at every drug, um, figured out the cost and it's supplicate uh, surfaces to the top just because it is the most expensive drug in the class. Um, and we do uh, control utilization of that drug with the prior authorization today. Um, so that, and, that's and, why uh, that has such a big impact. Um, I really ap I appreciate the, um, and we appreciate the, the, the explanation, and I will again repeat that we are a policy committee, and what keeps coming into my mind is how do we ensure 
that Vermonters who are struggling with opioid use disorder get their medication when they need it, how they need it. And so as you, I have to admit, because I'm not a money person, which is why I, <laughs> they keep me far away from there as possible. Um, when you, um, personally, I have a hard time with the worst case scenario because I'm looking at it um, in terms of uh, both the immediate for the individual or the individuals and then the potential um, cost avoided when those individuals are then able to um, work, able to go to school, able to more able to raise a family. But that's um, what I really appreciate, um, Commissioner, your speaking on behalf of Diva, your willingness to, and it may go nowhere, and I get that, um, but your willingness to, in the next, um, next week to continue the conversation that I know you've been having with um, Representative um, Whitman and sometimes with Representative Small in terms of, is there something um, that we can do or is there something in the report that we would be more helpful as we move forward um, or something as simple as you come back with a way to, but all of that, I mean, um, because I, um, as much as I wanted to try to find holes in, 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 in your analysis, um, I, I'm having trouble finding holes. Um, I also, you know. <laughs> I really, I really am not disappointed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and I think the Joint Fiscal Office is, is, uh, is breathing a sigh of relief as well. Um, uh, um, uh, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, just to um, clarify something with me, are we planning to have somebody from the hubs or, and spoke program to come in here? Because it appears on one side um, we're talking about the-, the, the um, 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 Representative McFawn, you have a good question. Are we planning on connecting with whether the we is a committee or whether the we is the continuation of the small group that worked on this is um, at this point up in the air because we have basically until, we basically have a week to do this. And so it may be a piece of this. And um, um, the commissioner has said that she will provide us with a few names of spoke people. And um, I would also recommend Hub, if, if that's okay with you, both. Okay. Madam Chair, uh, I never got to my question. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> my, my question is, uh, on one side, with the small group, we're hearing that uh, people aren't being served um, as well as they could be. And on the other side, we're hearing that there is no, doesn't appear to be any problem uh, in the hub and the spoke program. So I want that settled. And, and that's what we're gonna try to do. That's what we're, which means hearing from other people and talking um, to uh, other people. And you know, um, it's not gonna be a perfect system. Okay. I mean, you know. No, That's but the, the goal is improvement, right? The goal is yeah. that we improve and make it accessible while also being fiscally responsible and balancing that that scale as, as much as we can. So I appreciate the opportunity and we are absolutely committed to work with, with all of you and others. Thank you. Thank you very much for responding so quickly this morning and um, coming to have this conversation. I really appreciate that. Um, Likewise. Okay. Opportunity. Um, oh wait. Um. Oh, I just have a question, Madam Chair. Yes. Directing all my to the fiscal office. Uh, Nolan, could you? We can't hear you. Oh, I just have a quick question. Um, Representative Small, Whitman, and myself are scheduled for appropriations today at one. Would you like me to ask them to postpone? 
No. Would you like us to still go and present? Well, um, no, I mean, I, I, I think that um, it is Wednesday. And I, I think that will um, um, make them very nervous. Um, um, my suggestion um, would be to um, say that we, um, we understand the appropriations is going to do something to that, you know. Um, yeah, we prefer they not, but we understand they're going to do something and we may be coming with an amendment um, when the bill is, we, 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 when the bill is put on the floor, we will be asking for it to be delayed at, to, to the last possible date, which is I think Thursday, I mean, you know, or Friday to see if there is um, a step that is fiscally responsible that we can take. Okay, and with that, um, this ends, um, we're going to take a pause or um, we're gonna take a, a, a pause or move directly, are people waiting? People are waiting. So thank you um, everyone from DIVA, really appreciate it again. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful right, day.